Welcome to Meatheads. Today, we'll be discussing stretching, the importance of it, and how we don't do enough of it, our horror movie fantasy draft, and how we feel about fitness influencers in the gym. Have you ever been gaming or working online classes and your internet service constantly gets interrupted? First Nations Fiber is about to ensure that just won't happen again. Get ready for high speed at a new level. Click on fnfiber.com and sign up today. First Nations Fiber, empowering people through connectivity. Good morning and welcome to Meatheads. My name is Mark Lalone. I am joined, as always, by my good friend, CEO of Total Fitness here in Ganawage, Derek DeLille. Derek, how are you today? I'm doing fantastic. Yourself? I'm doing great. Losing my voice a little bit, but hey, that's what happens in June and when we start partying. So it is June. It is really nice and warm out there. You'd think that the conditions would uh, lend themselves to uh, feeling better physically, but uh, for the last couple of days, Derek, I have been walking around like an old man, and we're going to get into precisely why that is right now. So, Derek, you're a trainer. I'm a trainer. We both espouse the wonders of stretching to our clients. Derek, how much do you actually stretch? Myself, I unfortunately I can't say I do much stretching after my, my workouts. I usually do a little bit of dynamic stretching before to lose some of the, you know, the achy shoulders, uh, the knees, the hips. It's usually, I'm always pressed for time. It's like I try to get, get the, 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 the best bang for my hour of my own workouts. And then sometimes, you know, when my clients come in, I might do a little leg stretching as they're, as they're warming up, but it's not, nothing intense, nothing where I set aside for 20 minutes to do. I wish I did. And I tell all my clients, you should, I should. And I've been saying this for years. It just, for myself, it's hard to fit in. I'm, I'm right there with you. Um, I have always seen stretching as passive time that is not helping my body in any way, shape or form. So why do it? Because, you know, I know how I feel when I'm lifting heavy weights. I know how I feel I'm doing cardio and then the sweat is pouring off me, but I don't always feel the immediate gratification of stretching. And honestly, I really should do more of it. So I have spent the last couple of days walking around like an old man because I did leg day two days ago. I should have foam rolled and stretched appropriately at the end for at least 10 or 15 minutes. But as you say, sometimes I'm pressed for time and I got to get in and out of the gym and off to whatever else is happening. So frequently, you know, my days are pretty loaded up. And with my kids' schedule in flux these days because of exams are coming and going and classes are finished for high schoolers, I find myself in a position where sometimes I have to race off. And so I am immediately reminded of the importance of stretching when I'm in pain. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I can still relate to you because usually the day after a heavy workout, and it's usually leg or hip hip exercises, I'll talk to one of my clients who's, you know, my age and the same shape, stuff like that. I'm like, you know, buddy, we should really freaking stretch. And, and, you know, and he's like, well, maybe we should take yoga or maybe we could look at something and try to get the stretching and what I did, I actually downloaded a program that had some stretching. There it was an athletic stretching program and it had about 10 different stretches and some dynamic movements, foam rolling. And I, when I went through it, I realized like, it's hard to explain what one of the exercises was, but it was a deep lunge and I had to take my opposite elbow and try to touch the floor with it. So yep. it's like trying to stretch out your hips and your back and your glutes. And I'm just like, I am so not flexible in this, in this way. And, and you only realize that when you get to a certain age, because I find when you're young, you don't, you don't get sore after workout, really. You don't get tight. You don't get stiff. It's like, and you don't really think about it. And it's only when you get a little bit older, you should start thinking about it. And we say we should do it. But then to actually do it, let's just, let's be honest, it's, it's boring. You know, to sit there and hold a stretch for 30 seconds, like a static stretch, it's boring. It's not especially stimulating for me either. Frankly, I'd rather be moving. I'd rather feel the weight uh, loading my muscles. I would rather be sweating and exerting. But... The last couple of days have started to give me pause. And I guess that's what growing up is all about because now I'm starting to feel like this is affecting my quality of life. You know, I get up in the morning and, and it, you know, it takes me six minutes to put on my socks. Like that is really painful stuff. So it's getting to the point where I'm like, I got to warm my legs up in a, in a hot shower before I get up in the morning. You know, I've been realizing when, because you said that, you know, everybody wakes up and you do that little stretch with the arms on the edge of the bed. I, I've been noticing as I wake up, it's my calves and ankles that are really stiff. I'm like, man, and, and it's like I'm kind of, 
creeping to the to the bathroom to get ready for my shower yep. and it's just like why are my leg so tight like calf and ankle area and it doesn't even have to be a leg workout just be a normal waking just up. be a day yeah, yeah. no I, i'm discovering that as well as i get into my 40s uh or through my mid 40s as the case may be when i get up in the morning it it takes my body a solid 15 minutes to wake up like i'm i'm not awake and and honestly like i would think I would feel like the, the lying in bed would would make my legs feel better, and it's the opposite because they've been so stationary in one position for so long that they need to move and stretch, and and I and I just don't do a good enough job of it, frankly. Yeah, and and w when you sit back and look at that, we're like we're both trainers. We should bounce out of bed, you know, yeah. get ready, have that healthy breakfast, have your shower ready, and say, all right, boys, let's go. You know, if you have yep. kids, get them all up. But it's mostly like. Me a minute. Let me go take a shower, loosen up a little bit, yeah. brush my teeth, and then. And I got a lot of stairs in my house. And when I get downstairs, like God, like what's wrong with me? Those first stairs in the morning are never fun. They are never fun. And, and, and the older I get, the less fun they become. I'm like, I want to retire into a bungalow. That's you know, what I want to do. You know, I was joking around with my sons. I'm like, we had like three flights of stairs to get to the top. And I'm like, you know what? What's gonna happen in ten years? You know, right? Am I going to be able to get into my bedroom? I'm going to have to sleep in the garage. <laughs> this is what I'm saying. I I, I wonder about that because I'm like, I'm going to have to convert my my extension to a ground floor bedroom and want to put my washing machine and my dryer on the main floor too. So I don't have to do the the, 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 the basement stairs with the big laundry baskets anymore. And mm -hmm. it'll become less of an issue when my kids move out of the house, obviously. But for the time being, it's, it's, it's a little unwieldy. So um, I guess the, the, secret message in all of this is take eight to 10 minutes at the end of your workout and stretch your legs. Oh yeah. Especially I find your hips. I find it's the hips that get tight a lot for a lot of people, hamstrings, hips. It is. It's my glutes and the attachment point where the hamstrings meet the glutes. That is my stiffest spot. And I, I, for whatever reason, I cannot find a way to be comfortable in that position at any point. Do you have a favorite stretch that you use? You know, I have this stretch and and I found it online. It was just because it, it, the caption got me. It said, if you don't like stretching, read this article. So what it, what it pretty much is, um, it's kind of like a, like an inchworm. You crawl out to a push up. you do a push-up, inchworm back into a squat, and you stand up. And it's supposed to pretty much stretch everything in your body. There's even like a, a downward dog in that stretch as well. It's right like for your lower back. Sure. Yeah. So okay. I usually just call it the, uh, the, uh, the every, the everything stretch. And I just right. try to do that either after my workout or just when I'm kind of like hanging out between clients and you know, you're just sitting around mm -hmm. instead of doing that, I'll do some of that. Right. One of the ones I used to really love back. <laughs> so I did, I, I, I was a lot better at stretching when I was teaching classes in person. Um, before the pandemic hit, I was teaching anywhere between 14 and 20 hours a week of, of fitness classes. So at the end of every class, I was going through a stretch with my students. Uh, if I was teaching a spinning class, we were focusing our, our stretches on the lower body. And, uh, I was actually responsible with my stretching in those days. One of my favorites is, is simply putting your hand on the spin bike or whatever, you know, for balance, crossing one foot over the opposite knee and dropping into a single leg squat. What that does is that totally dislodges all the, 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 the tightness in my, in my gluten hamstring and, and that, that sort of the exterior upper leg that, that, you know, and it's just so satisfying. So, I guess the moral of the story is we should stretch and we should do it more often. Yeah. Especially when you're training, because sometimes if, if I have that stretch on the board or any stretch and there's a client or even any exercise and a client says, well, what is that? And then you proceed to show it to them. And all of a sudden like, Oh my God, I can't do this. I'm tight. And then you're like, Oh, I just had a leg workout yesterday. That's why I'm so tight. And I can't do the stretch, but it's kind of like this. And you just look kind of foolish when you're trying to demonstrate an exercise or a stretch and you can't do it yourself. Yeah. And you're like, Oh my God, this yeah. is so tight. What's going on there? Yeah. And that, that happened to me the other day. I was working with a client I'm like, well, it's time for us to stretch. And she's like, how do we do it? And I'm like, oh, like this. And it caused me a lot of pain to do it. So be that as it may. Um, those are those are my favorites. I actually, one of my favorites for upper body is, uh, it's an everything stretch, but it isn't, it, it, you don't have any body weight on your upper body. It's you're going to lie on the floor and you do an open book. It's a yoga stretch. You lie on one side or the other in the fetal position, knees together. 
then you open your torso up and open your arms up to try and open wide. It gets your chest, your triceps, your shoulders, your, your biceps, your lats, everything in the upper body gets done with that one stretch. So that's one of my favorites. And God, does it feel good. You just lie in there and, 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 stretch and, and holding it open. And better yet, it's not a leg stretch. So even better. Like, I can't tell you how often I'd be like, oh, my arms, I got to stretch more and then I don't do it. And I'm just in pain. Oh, there's one stretch I usually do for my upper body when I'm, even when I'm training clients here, walking around, seeing what they're doing. I just grab a band and I do uh, dislocators when yeah. you put it over your head and behind your back. And because you're using a band, you can stretch it open. You can yeah. go as wide as you can. And I just do that throughout the day to help loosen up my shoulders. Cause you know, the rotator cuffs kind of get sore once they in a while. very and, sore. Yeah. So, you know, try that throughout I, the day. I, I've noticed that the more humid it gets, the less I feel the weight on my muscles and the more I feel it on mm -hmm. my joints. Mm -hmm. Like the, if it's a rainy, humid day, like on, like today when we're recording, I will feel that more in my joints, in my hands, my wrists, my elbows, and my shoulders. It's, it's uh, getting old just sucks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it just sucks. And, and speaking of getting old, we're going to, uh, we're going to switch gears a little bit now. We're going to, uh, you know, identify our very favorite horror movie villains. We're going to have a little fantasy draft here like we've had in the past with others. I think the goal is to create the most intimidating and most frightening and most, I guess, powerful collection of, of horror movie villains. So we're going to draft five each. And uh, I'll explain to you why I'm going to win afterwards. So <laughs> we're going to let's um, let's let's go ahead and start having that conversation. So I'm going to give you the first overall pick because I'm a good person. Okay. I'm going to let you have the first choice. And so I have my guy at number one. If you take him, great. If you don't, pff, he's coming off the board. So Derek, it's all yours. Well, this one is actually one of my, my son's favorite characters. I, I, he dressed up for him for Halloween many times, and it would be good old Jason. Jason Voorhees. Yeah, it never dies. He's been around for 10 movies, if not more. I think and it's, it's, yeah, it's like 11, might be 11 movies, because there was a Jason X yeah. where they went to space, which I didn't understand. Me neither. But hey, to each their own. I don't, I don't judge. Mm -hmm. uh, I do love the Friday the 13th movies as well. Jason was my absolute first favorite. And and to your point, he's in a great and and fairly easy Halloween costume to execute. And he's also scary. Like if you would see that in the forest, if you didn't know anything about Jason, you just see a guy in a hockey mask. He's like, what? And he looks like a big yeah, he's a big dude holding big, a machete. Yeah. I mean, I, I'd probably run too. You know what? Yeah, that is something that I would uh, I would definitely do. Now I love Jason, I love him, but he is an imitator. He is an imitator, and the greatest of all time in my mind, the goat, is Michael Myers. The Shape, the villain of, a 90, of the 1978 horror classic that started it all, Halloween. Uh, Michael Myers is indestructible. Michael Myers is really smart in a way that Jason might not be. Michael is, is pure out-and-out -out evil, whereas Jason just seems to be some sort of alien from another planet here to coldly execute teenagers for having premarital sex. So... I mean, that's my guy is Jason and I'm going to, I mean, my guy is Michael Myers. So I'm going to go ahead and give you, you got Jason. See, Michael Myers was our, our second one that we were talking about in the car this morning. And, uh, all right. So let's so see. Michael Myers is your two. Yeah, eh? yeah, I'm, he, I'm glad I took him off the board because that's my guy. And, and to your point, I think he's responsible for some of the greatest scares in horror movie history. So moving right along. I probably had to go with the, another cult favorite, and that would have to be Freddy. Freddy Krueger. Yeah, like he does have weaknesses, which I <laughs> argued about with my son in the car this morning. Mm -hmm. But I find, unless you have a strong mind, he could get you in your in your dreams. I agree with you. You know, if you can turn your dream around and you're the powerful person, but most people can't. You can't. Most people can't control their dreams. So if he's in there, he's got gotcha. you. Yeah, that's a pretty that's a pretty insidious choice, and I'll tell you why because it's really hard to defend yourself against a mental villain, a villain who lives inside your own head. In fact, you know it's a nice allegory for you know a lot of the issues that uh, that 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 the bedevil people in the world today. You know they can't get out of their own head; their demons are inside them, and it's for them to fight and only for them. 
Unless, uh, you know, you're a psychopath yourself and your mind's warped. Well, in that case, I think I'd like my chances <laughs> against Freddie in my dream. But, you know, be that as it may, we could have this discussion all day. And, and, and maybe one day our viewers or our listeners would love to have that discussion longer. But I think for today, we'll, we'll keep it a bit shorter. I'm going to go off the board here and I'm going to go with a, a new villain. And it isn't a villain that you might have considered too much, but. Um, the Hellboy reboot from 2017 or 18 with David Harbour features uh, a little bit of a, a vignette at the end, uh, a minute and a half or so of what hell on earth might look like with these massive hell spawn demons walking around, uh, essentially picking up people, slicing them, this, that, and the other thing, doing all kinds of horrible things to them. And so my choice is the two massive walking sentinels that invade crawl out of a crack in the earth and start walking up and murdering people in the worst horrible way possible the minute and a half of watching hell on earth happen it made made me almost i had to go pee really it, yeah it scared me it scared me a lot and so that feeling stuck with me and so my choice at number two is my two hell spawns. So I got Michael Myers. He's the evil genius running the show. And then I got these two massive hell spawn demons coming down to make your life hard. All right. So number three, he is, I guess, defeatable, but Leatherface. Leatherface. I'm really glad you mentioned Leatherface because I was hoping you would throw him back in my face earlier when I said <laughs> that the originator was Michael Myers and, and reality is the originator is, is Leatherface it's and the Texas Chainsaw Psycho Massacre. and Mask. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think, I, I, like... They were first. Yeah, he was a person, but it just, he was just so terrifying with the skin on his face and just, it's just a terrifying... I guess, redneck. Just the idea, back. the idea itself is just, yeah, it's, it's it, awful. Yeah, and just what the, the, the type of... Uh, type of killing that they do, it was kind of scary, even though, you know, he killed cops. So gun didn't really phase him. Right. Guns were yeah. of no concern. But it just fear, you know, he's yeah. defeatable, but it's just the fear. Yeah. That, that makes total sense to me. And I, and it brings me to my next choice, which um, is another one that I'm going to go off the board here. And uh, I don't know if you're too familiar with the 2012 classic, the cabin in the woods. Mm hmm um where horror movie tropes were set on their side you know like basically it's part of it you know the story was that these five teenagers were brought to this you know horror movie locale for them all to be killed off in the in the idea of sacrificing them to a, a greater older bloodthirsty god so in this movie there's this underground um you know agency of people whose job it is to send these terrifying monsters up to kill these kids so my um, my choice is coming off the board is I am going to go ahead and take uh, all the monsters from Cabin in the Woods. There's this, another moment late in the movie, like in Hellboy, where all these monsters get released onto the world all at once. And again, I cannot really emphasize just how much that made me want to, you know, Re release pee in my shorts okay <laughs> at the very least like it, it frightened me no no end and so whenever i discuss these um these possibilities i'm like i want the things on my team that frighten me and so those monsters from the cabin in the woods i'm gonna take them as one lump group i'm taking the monsters from the cabin in the woods okay so we're looking at now i've got i've got michael i've got my cabin in the woods monsters and I got my Hellboy demons. You have Freddy Krueger. You have Jason. And you have... Uh, Leatherface. Leatherface. Right. So you're living in the, uh, in, in the very visceral real world here with your See, people. I, I, I find, for me, horror movies, if it's as close to real world, for me, it's a little bit more intimidating. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, I, I, we, like, just when we watch Freddy, we know mm -hmm. he's an he's a imaginary made-up thing. Right. Uh, Leatherface, he... He could have been a real person. Uh, another horror one would probably be Dracula. He Ooh, was, he was terrifying as, as a kid. It's not a, a mainstream, you know, like like a Jason or Freddy. A very oh, wow. I mean, you could uh, argue yeah. he was mainstream for the first seventy five years of of movie film. I'm not sure there's a character who's been portrayed more. That's often. true. That's true. So Dracula is an Dracula. excellent one. Like Do he you? does have uh, he does have um, 
you know, there's ways to kill him and everything. But again, it's that kind of realistic, possible in a fantasy type. Do you have a preferred Dracula? Like, do you like Bram Stoker's Dracula? You like Bram the Stoker. One? Bram Stoker's yeah, that, Dracula? That one kind of, it brought me in when I, when I watched as a child. It was kind of like, well, it was scary. It was just creepy that it was just kind of like a normal character, but also he's Dracula. Right. I, uh, I liked... I like the Blade franchise's take on Dracula in Blade mm -hmm. 2, where they sort of had this ultimate vampire who was, you know, three times more powerful than all the other vampires who were just there to get toasted by Blade. And uh, I always thought that was an interesting take. But to your point, Bram Stoker's Dracula is the classic. It is one of the best ones ever. So I'm going to also go off the board here, and I'm going with a classic horror movie icon here. I'm going with The Wolfman. Because werewolves still terrify me to this day. You know, if I've got these hell demons, I've got, you know, I've got Michael Myers sort of running the show. I've got my cabin in the woods monsters. I want something a little bit more real world to be able to take care of some business on the ground. So I'm going to, I'm going to go with that one right there. That's going to be my, that's going to be my fourth pick. So I'm going to go ahead and give you your fifth. I have to think about this one. There's like so many there on top of my head. Mm-hmm. Uh, some are foolish characters, you know, like the whole Chucky's and all that. That's kind of like toyish. Yeah, um, I never got, I never got the Chucky, the mm -hmm. the, the the frightening Chucky. I'm like Chucky's a, a doll that's a foot high. I would just punt him into next week. I told my son, I said, all you gotta do is tie him to a tree. What's he gonna do? Unless he stabs you on the web, there you're just gonna tie him to a tree. He's gonna hang. He's like what, one feet tall? Well, <laughs> how can he? How can he even carry a knife big enough to harm anyone? You know, I'm like, I, I maybe he'll slice my Achilles tendon or something, but I, I can't, I'm not, I was never afraid of Chucky. I always found child's play to be sort of on the ridiculous side. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. I'm going to let you go for your fifth one. How do you think for mine? All right. Well, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to take two because you let me. Okay. Um, uh, I, I need an evil genius. I need someone to coordinate all of my evil geniuses to take their ultimate evil and make it one evil and that that one guy is going to be jigsaw from the oh, saw movie i forgot about him yeah yes. he's a he's a mastermind he's not especially terrifying in terms of what his physicality or you know what he brings to the table in terms of you know being undead or this or that but jigsaw is is very much a calculating evil genius and he will take my people and make them ju you know twice as bad as they were and my second one in there is I'm going to reach off the board and I'm taking a Voldemort from the Harry Potter series. Oh, right, right. Maybe not a horror movie villain, but he's terrifying and evil. And boy, oh boy, does he have magic. So having that magic is going to help me a lot. Those are those are my two my two choices at five. So you go ahead, you take your fifth. I'll go with uh, Darth Vader if we're going to go for- Oh man, yeah, okay. Yeah, he's, uh, he's sadistic. He's got the, uh, the force- you know, he's scary. He does. He's intimidating. He is scary. His voice is scary. And if he showed up in my room or yes, my house. Just the yeah. breathing alone would 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 right. be enough to, for me to just be like, me, no, no, thank you. I'm terrified. Yeah. That's a great choice. Good call on Vader. See, when we think of like horror or villains, we think of like horror movies. And, yeah. And Star Wars isn't really a horror movie, but he is a scary villain. He is you a know? scary As villain. As a kid, of course he scared me, you know. Actually, something funny, real quick here. Go my for son, it. my son has um, uh, VR. Yeah, and he has this uh, Dracula, or not Dracula. He has um, a Star Wars game. Yeah, and I came toe to toe with Darth Vader. And in real life, I'm six feet tall, so it kind of sets you up as a six foot tall person. And I was looking up to Darth Vader, and he's breathing right in front of me. And I'm supposed to sword fight him, right? And it was intimidating. It was scary because you're into the game. You're into the, the what's going on. And you look up to him. He's like seven feet tall. And, oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. 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 That would be terrifying. And, and to add to your point, if you have you been watching the Obi-Wan series on Not Disney yet. Plus? Not yet. I want to. Okay. So I highly recommend doing it because Vader is going to be that much more terrifying to you when you see it. Mm. I promise. The Vader that shows up in Obi-Wan is definitely, to my mind, the scariest and most sadistic Vader I've seen. Wow, eh? Yes, of all the movies. So that's that's a great call. I'm really impressed with your Darth Vader choice there. Way to think outside the box and uh, and get off the board with that. That reminds me of actually another story, speaking of boxes and thinking outside of them. It brings me to a story about uh, that we're following in Longay. Longay uh, is a neighboring community to Gunawage. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's not that far away, but it's, it's, it's far enough to feel 
like a different place. And it really is. That being said, uh, the Longueuil City Council has uh, undertaken a pilot project this year where they're attempting to uh, make streets a little bit safer for children to play in. So with the idea that, that, you know, the pandemic has passed, children should be able to get out and play more. They should have more spaces available to them. They should be able to play in the street like we did when we were kids. Like I, I promise you, every day from grade seven to grade 11, my friends and I played street hockey on someone's street every day. You know, and if a car came along, you lifted the net, you said car, you stopped playing for a second, you put it back, and, and that was it. You had a, there was a relationship. There was a give and take. There was a, the car would wait, you'd move the net, and the car would go. There was a social contract. Longueuil has started a pilot project where they have installed planter boxes in the middle of certain streets in an effort to make those streets more child-friendly. And it's a pilot project, and the idea is that traffic would be slowed down a little bit so that kids could have a safer spot to play, say, street hockey, hopscotch, you know, and people say, well, why can't they play on their lawns? Well, when we were kids, we didn't always just play on our lawns either. And and then today, the feeling is that kids should have those same rights. Um, how do you feel about such a project? You know what? We grew up to this, you know, in my front, in, in my front yard, we play street hockey. Uh, I even have a basketball net in there. And the basketball net, it's actually, I have like, um, in front of my house, there's a, a two lane running path, path I guess. Yeah. yeah. And I, I put my, my basketball net there. Not sure if I could or not. I don't know. And no one ever says anything. The runners come by, they wave to us, you know, we're playing, they're jogging, it's exercising. Sometimes we're playing basketball, a car comes by and like, here, pass, pass, I'll shoot, you know, just having fun with us. And I see nothing wrong with it. I mean, it's not like this pilot program. Are they encouraging a mob of kids to just no, no, run it's around just, the streets? Yeah, it's just a, a program wherein um, kids are, you know, encouraged to play in the street because they've taken traffic calming measures. It's become a huge issue in Longueuil. It has become a gigantic issue. What you have, what we're seeing now is motorists who aren't happy with having to wait a couple of extra seconds for the kids to get out of their way are giving the kids the finger are screaming at children and families are attempting to go out of their way to intimidate people by driving erratically by accelerating suddenly by driving up quickly and braking suddenly all all behaviors designed to make people feel less comfortable in the street it's gotten to the point where longueuil city council somebody's approached longueuil city council about pulling off about pulling the 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 project out of the streets and my question is why would they do that you know if it's on like a back road where people live you know not like on a main street you know that's fine you know the like most people's homes nowadays, their front yard isn't really very big. It's just a, a little yard, backyard yep. might be, if they even have a front or backyard, depending if they have like an apartment or whatnot. So kids will play in the streets. And as long as, you know, there, there's, there's mutual respect and they do move and the cars come, there shouldn't be a problem. Like people, these, these roads are usually 30 kilometers top. So people shouldn't be driving fast anyways. You know, a little example for myself, I was telling you on my way, my, on my way here, I was driving, driving here and right before I get to the main road, there's a, a big park mm -hmm. and there was a mob of kids there with a gym teacher. And I know sometimes they do track and field around that area or in the park, but there was about maybe 50, 60, maybe more kids just kind of like in, in a herd. Mm -hmm. And I looked at it and I'm like, all right, whatever. They're probably doing some last minute gym stuff outside. So I just kind of went down the next road, turned around, went to the road for me. It wasn't a problem. Sure. You no, know, and, like, and, and I think, I feel like that's, your attitude is is what we should be doing. You I should. mean, these are children in the road. They're children. <laughs> they, mm -hmm. you know, like, I don't want to put too fine a point on it, but if you're a person, I don't know, it, largely the people who are complaining on record are in their 60s and 70s. Mm -hmm. If you are a person in your 60s and 70s and you're driving down the street and some kids playing in the road somehow irritates you, or delays you or puts you behind to the point where you feel like you have to give them the finger, curse them out, or somehow intimidate little children, then I would posit that there's something very, very wrong with you. Yeah, that's a little bit extreme. Like the finger being, just being a bully to kids, it just doesn't teach them anything. They're mm -hmm. going to, they'll probably retaliate back to them and just cause a big whole scene for I, nothing. I have DE, uh, the French language uh, news network went down there to do a story the other day and we're filming people's reactions and asking for reactions. And they were filming one person and he asked, somebody asked a, a motorist about it. And the motorist just turned and, and nodded his head towards a baseball bat saying, 
essentially saying, well, if you don't stop asking me questions, I'm going to hit you with a baseball bat. For real. Wow. For real. It's, um, it's a major concern. And uh, honestly, it's, it's something I'm not a fan of. Like, I literally want to go over there right now, stand in the middle of the road and say, hey, old people, take your shots. Because I hate bullies. I hate them. Mm-hmm. Um, no matter what form they take, I dislike bullies. So my natural default reaction would be go, oh, hey, you want to, let's go bully the bullies for a little while. Right, right. You know, I want to one of them make them feel the same fear that they put in the hearts of little children when they pass by them and, and accelerate quickly in their 2,000 pound <laughs> death machine. So that's where I'm at on that. I, I can't even for a second consider it wouldn't be okay to let kids play in the street. Kids got to move. Kids got to play. You know, kids got to go out. I think sometimes these older people, they, they tend to forget that they were young at one point. And they, if they're 60, 70, they've definitely played in the street. They played stick ball and, you know, probably accidentally broke windows. And, you know, it's part of life. You know, it's just it's kids. part of life. Yeah, it's going to happen. And I don't, I think they just forgot how to have fun again. And they're so stressed up in their own lives and their own appointments and their own uh, agenda that they forget about what's going around with uh, around them. They well, just focus on, I got to get here, kids are in the way. Yeah, I'm going to get Hong angry. I, I think a lot of that has to do with the pandemic. We've spent yep. the last 27 months learning to not live with each other, and now we have to learn to live with each other all over again. But you know what? It's so great. I, I went shopping with my sons and everybody and no mask. It, it just feels so free, you know, so free again. Yeah, the other day I remember thinking I went into the gym and I'm like, oh, I don't have to put on a mask. This is wonderful. It's mm-hmm. really quite a relief. I enjoyed that a great deal. So speaking of going into the gym and not having a mask on. So the other day I was in the gym and uh, I saw a, a person in their 20s setting up a camera to film their squats. And they set up this camera across from the squat rack in a way that would basically um, in a walkway. So the camera was set up in a walkway and people kept passing by to pick up weights or put their equipment away or go to the next station or whatever they were doing. And I saw this in this influencer. I saw this person who is taking pictures of themselves or video of themselves doing their squats to theoretically put up on the internet, giving people dirty looks as they walked past while she was trying to record her squats. And I think to myself, you have to be one selfish MF to think that you setting up your camera is going to somehow or, or should stop people from putting their weights away and, and, and going about their business in the gym. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm happy in a sense that I haven't been to a public gym in a long time to see any of this stuff. I'll, I, I just probably cringe and just not want to go there. Just the, the, every, the whole thing about going work out for yourself has changed. It's more like I'm going to work out, showcase what I'm doing online so I can get all the likes I can and do whatever they do. And I don't know. I just find it's a little bit too much. It, it really is too much. It's the gym is a shared space. Mm-hmm. It's not your film studio. It's not your place to use by yourself as you see fit. In fact, I would argue it's a place where people need to learn better to share and communicate. And when your entire focus is on, you know, you filming yourself, then your focus takes off. Well, how can I live in this greater ecosystem that everybody is a shared space for everybody to be happy and comfortable in. And, and that self-centeredness sort of has bled over from maybe social media and into a space where self-centeredness is not valued. You know, there, there's a, there's a video that was posted the other day and I only see these on, on YouTube or whichever uh, station I'm watching. And it was a girl that re- was recording herself. All right. And and there's a guy maybe on the other side of the gym on a chest press machine with his trainer. And she's she's wearing short little booty shorts. And then she's slowly taking off her top to show her halter top. And and all of a sudden, I guess she was editing after the fact it happened. They zoomed in on to the guy doing chest press and it went into a slow motion mode. So while he glanced at her, glanced at her, it made it look as if he was staring at her because right. it was slow motion. And then she, she made a, a loud comment like, oh. Is there is something I can help you with? So the trainer comes up, excuse me, what, what was that? I didn't hear you. And she's like, oh, is there something I can help you with? And he's like, what, what do you mean? She goes, oh, that's what I thought. And he's like, what? So he went to the, the manager of the gym and they spoke to her and eventually they, they told her to leave. Right. And what the video on her side portrayed was they were looking at her oogling as she's slowly taking off mm-hmm. her top. Mm-hmm. But she, she edited it in a way where it was slow motion. So it looked as if they were staring at her where it was just kind of like, yeah, you uh, pick up your look. head and it's something yeah, you look like, at. Yeah, and, no. and, 
And they're even saying, okay, she's pretty. If you're at a public gym, you might get a glance. It wasn't like he was two feet in front of her, just oogling over there. It was just kind of like, hey, look at that. Okay. I I had a similar experience uh, the other day um, that I saw on YouTube. And it was uh, a lifter who was in booty shorts showing off uh, her tush and a sports bra. It's fine. It's, it's, that's my daughter works out in that stuff these days. That's the way it goes. But the camera was set up at a lower, at a lower angle so that everybody could see her butt as she did squats. So the focus was on her butt. She wanted to show her butt. The message was, Hey, everybody, look at how great my butt is. In this very same video, there's a guy picking up weights. He looks over, looks back as he's picking up weights, puts on his thing. And she's like, Oh, that dude is perving on me. And I'm like, okay, that dude who's four stations over from you is perving on you, but your hundreds or thousands of followers on the internet getting a nice low view of your butt is somehow not perving? I don't understand. But his likes don't count because it's not on her social media page. That's right. And and he probably (laughs) didn't like her video. So that's something that uh, is an issue. So this is another situation where I see bullies throwing their weight around in the gym. And in this regard, it's social media bullies. And I don't like it. I've never liked bullies. Mm -hmm. It's a shared space. Learn to share. Sharing is caring. Speaking of which, um, did you hear Post Malone had to uh, cancel some dates on his tour this I just heard that this morning. Yeah, I think they should call him Postpone Malone now. (laughs) Um, I didn't want to announce the dad joke of the week, but uh, I really couldn't help myself, Derek. I apologize. It's been a great podcast. Thank you for listening, as always, uh, to everyone out there in in our audience. Um, it's I'm pretty sure my fantasy horror draft is is going to beat your fantasy horror draft, but we'll <laughs> we'll let our we'll let our listeners decide that. Uh, it's been a pleasure, Derek Delille, CEO of Total Fitness. Thank you so much for for being a part of this, as always. Thank you. My name is Mark Lalonde, and this has been Meatheads. Everybody have a wonderful week. Anna. Thanks for listening to Meatheads, and please, please check out our other podcasts on Apple, Spotify, or Google, or anywhere you listen to podcasts. Check out the front page, profiles, and the beating table. The views and opinions of the guests expressed in this podcast do not reflect those of your DWSA and its employees.